If I didn't think that I could be the best at something, then my inner critic would grab a hold of that and say, well, if you're not going to be the best at it, why do it? Some of the greatest inventions in the world that we all enjoy are because of mistakes, not because they're already perfect. Is that really perfectionism or is it my preference? Perfectionism to me is a one-way street where when we look at something like preference, it becomes a collaboration, which is a lot more in alignment with the universal structure, which is always in collaboration. Preference is change. Perfection feels so it is or it isn't. If we just stopped and said, oh, well, they're, they're the best, so they're perfect. Well, then we just stop innovating. Hey, Heart Leader community, this is Amber Mikesell, and I am so excited. Silent Your Inner Critic has a release date. We'll be hitting shelves March of 2025, and you have an opportunity to get on the wait list by clicking the link below. And when you do, you're going to immediately get a gift from me. It is the Silent Your Inner Critic Starter Kit, where you'll get 13 tips to get started on silencing your inner critic before the book hits the shelves. Do you feel that perfection is a state of mind, a state of being, or a device used by your inner critic to keep you from moving forward toward the things that you truly desire. If you, someone was to ask you, what is perfectionism to you and where do you have it in your life? What would you say? Ooh, that's a great question. Uh, I feel like two part. I feel like it's a state of ego mm. and I feel that it is perfectionism is stagnation and therefore an illusion. There you go. What makes perfectionism stagnation to you or being static or staying in place? Perfect is an end result. So if you're perfect, then how do you keep getting better? Yes. And then so many people are so focused on being perfect or they're, they say, I'm a perfectionist. And even if they don't, maybe, maybe not everyone means it in that way. Maybe it's a, it's a way they're like, Hey, I like to keep getting better. Well then if that's the case, they're talking to themselves incorrectly because getting constantly getting better and being perfect are two very different things. Yes. And so there's a, a one puts an unnecessary amount of pressure on something that is an illusion and unattainable because what is perfect to me is very different than what is perfect to you. Yeah. And so that is to me, one of the main arguments that unfold that um, unravels perfectionism is because perfectionism is, comes at it from a standpoint of it's like an assumption that there is only one way in that way is the one thing that is perfect. Yet when we attempt to define it, it is all over the place and therefore it is non-concrete. It's actually very fluid. And so you can't, if you're putting all your eggs in that basket of, of a concrete and when it's actually fluid and then you're just never going to attain it. So that's why it, it's an illusion. And to clarify, when you say that perfectionism isn't real, it comes from the place of the differences between us as beings and what we feel is perfect. So if, if we're seeking to get outside of our own what kind of way and internal view, then perfectionism is something that's actually keeping us limited because we're not embracing the fact that what's perfect to me is not necessarily perfect to you. And we've talked about this on a previous podcast around ice cream, right? Yeah. And it's one of the things I talk about in the book, Silence Your Inner Critic. You know, the perfect flavor of ice cream for me is not going to be the perfect flavor of ice cream for you. So who's right? Mm -hmm. And does that feed the ego? Yeah. As you said, because if we held to that, then man, ice cream would be joyless for a lot of us, right? right. Because whoever's making ice cream would determine what is perfect and that would be it. And then we'd all be stuck with that. Right. Right. That's not fun. No, no, not at all. Um, and plus it's oftentimes when it's used, it's only used, uh, it's cherry picked. Yes. So if you're a perfectionist, 
But, you know, what happens when you consistently make mistakes? You know, why are you putting that unnecessary pressure on yourself? Some of the greatest inventions in the world that we all enjoy are because of mistakes, not because they're already perfect. If they were perfect, they would have already been invented. Yes. Like part of the whole experience of this. Uh, and, and I think that's what, that's what this is all, like this understanding of perfectionism is just, uh, you know, someone could say it's semantics, but there's a lot of energy around semantics. There's a lot of energy around the word that we hold. Yeah. And there's a lot of package around the word perfect or perfectionism. Yes. And so when we can unload that, let it go and recognize that it's not a result. If you do want to use perfectionism in your in your life or talk about that, then maybe seek to redefine it into a process rather than a result. Because to me, perfection is not in the result. It's in the opportunity to continue to get better in the process in which this universe is growing and always expanding. Well, that's when we can bring that into our lives and we have the opportunity to grow and expand and learn more and experience a limitless amount of things that to me, oh wait, well, that to me is perfect. Yes. That's exciting. But again, that to you is perfect, yeah. right? True. And that's what I really feel is important for us to dive into is how does perfectionism actually limit us? Mm-hmm feed the inner critic like we talked about in our previous podcast and actually holds you back from the very thing that the very goal you do desire to get to right and speaking from my own experience with perfectionism tendencies if i didn't think that i could be the best at something sometimes then my inner critic would grab a hold of that and say Well, if you're not going to be the best at it, why do it? Mm -hmm. Right. And holding to your philosophy of it's the journey, not the end result. I had to move out of perfectionism and into learning opportunities. Mm -hmm. And how is everything a learning and growth opportunity for me because I'm not perfect? Right. If I were perfect, I would have nothing more to learn. But that would be me limiting myself because there is no such thing as perfect. Mm -hmm. It is what is perfect for me. So if I put myself into that box and say, well, if I'm not going to be perfect at it in whose eyes, then I'm not even going to go for it. Or If I have perfectionism tendencies, like I want my space to look a very certain way, is that really perfectionism or is it my preference? So preferencesism, right? (laughs) We'll call it preferencesism. My preference is to have a space that looks and functions in this way and everything must be in that place. And then all of a sudden I invite somebody else into my place and their perfect or their approach to things is different than my approach to things. We're going to have a fight. And how do we reconcile that versus coming at it from here's my preferencesisms and those are your preferencesisms. How can I learn from what you prefer? You learn from what I prefer, and then we create something even better, even better in that way because you saw things differently than I saw things. Yeah, I like that. There's so many good things that you touched on in there. Um, I'd like to break it down. Break it down, baby. <laughs> break it down. <laughs> um, one is the I've – heard, I've heard so many people say what you said, and it's like, okay, well, you know, I want to uh, – I'm a perfectionist because I'm, if I'm not going to do something, I, I want to be the best at something or else why do it? Yes. Right? Well, I'm sorry, but what a lofty assumption to assume that you being the best is the perfect at it. I mean, even even the best at anything, it, like in, especially in sports, like the best golfers are still not perfect at golf. Yes. So that's a that's a crazy assumption. And sometimes they're really good at it because they're not perfect. Like oh. a swing that's not technically perfect yeah. can be 
perfect for you yes. to get you to where you desire to go right. on the course, right? Yeah. But no one's, no one's like gone to a golf course and shot 18. Like it just hasn't, it's never happened. And that to me is an exciting part about golf is yeah. that even the best golfers in the world are never going to beat golf. But that you can apply that to almost everything. There's a reason why records keep getting broken and things keep, you know, we keep evolving as a society. Because if we just stopped and said, oh, well, they're, they're the best, so they're perfect. Well, then we'd just stop innovating. Yes. We'd stop breaking records because we would make that assumption that it's already there. When in fact, there's a whole plethora of space between the be quote unquote best and the ideological perfect. Yes. So I think that's an unnecessary pressure to place on oneself. And again, back to the result versus the process, right? Why limit to a result? Like, just because if you want to do something, I'm, there's a lot of things I'm not great at, you know, but sometimes it's just fun. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's, you just want to go and just do it because it's fun. You don't have to be the best at it. Like me and karaoke. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, same, you know, uh, so it's just, we just, you just want to enjoy and maybe that is quote unquote, like the experience of it, of having joy is perfect. Maybe that's it. And so I think this, this, the semantics, uh, and understanding behind it is so, is so relative in, into the discussion of this and, and why we place this unnecessary pressure on ourselves versus like you said, the preferences. Yes. And when we embrace it as preference, then it opens up, at least for me, it opens up this feeling of, well, this is my preference. What I preferred when I was 20 is not what I prefer at this time in my life, which means preferences change. Perfection feels so it is or it isn't. It's black and it's white. Mm -hmm. Where preferences move, they evolve as you evolve. And that's so freeing. Yeah. It's so empowering in many ways because it shows that no matter what, I'm always going to be growing. And there's fun in that journey, yeah. right? There's things to learn, to tackle, to, to just move through. And every one of those can add to my preferences. If it's perfect, then nothing can add to it. It's a closed box. Yes. Right? That's number two that I wanted to kind of talk about. Awesome. Yes. Go for it, baby. <laughs> um, so as we dive deeper into understanding the universal structure, we start to recognize, you know, that there is a greater sense of collaboration in everything, that everything has a connection point that it's not like we think, especially on an individual level, when we feel like we're siloed or we're on our own or we're alone or by ourselves, you know, that's, these are feelings that we have, but there are, the reality is, is that there's a lot more there's, there is a collaboration just yeah. because of, you know, oftentimes those, and, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not going through here to knock people who feel alone. Like that's not what this is about. This is, that's a separate thing that is a serious conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, but as someone who grew up as an only child who spent a lot of time alone, uh, I realized that I could choose to be alone or I could choose to be with myself. One is a one way street and the other is a collaboration. And I'm going to expand on that because I recognize that when I say I am with myself, that's a collaboration. That's uh, understanding that there are, are two facets to this. There's like the soul self and the human self. And so now I get to be, you know, Eckhart Tolle talks about that a lot, right? And he's like, I hate myself. And that was his realization of that statement got him from I hate myself to I love myself because he realized that the myself could shift in relation to the I. And the I could then love himself, like you know, I can love myself. And that could be a, a transformation. Yeah. Um, and so the reason I'm bringing all this up is because perfectionism to me is a one-way street where when we look at something like preference, it becomes a collaboration, which is a lot more in alignment with the universal structure, which is always in collaboration. Uh, everything is impacted by 
something or all things to a, to a degree, right? And that's you can dive into the quantum sciences of that one. I, that's out of my out of my realm. Observer effect, all of these things that go into it. So if anybody's interested in quantum entanglement, yes, um, there's lots of different touch points in quantum sciences that mm -hmm. really when applied not only to quanta and energy but to consciousness itself starts to open up a whole like whoa <laughs> but yeah different conversation different deep dive yeah so that's why i think to a degree it's important to point this out and I, prior to this conversation i really ever thought about it um is that when we are viewing it from perspective from perfection it's it is it's closed off it's one way and there's there's nothing can be added to it as you were saying, that third part, right? Yeah. So that's that's not the way of the universal structure. Or at least that's an illusion that there is because a lot of people are closed off one way and feel like no one can add to it. And it's not just people. There's ideologies around it and there's, you know, where it's like this is this is the way, you know, no pun intended to the Mandalorians, but yeah, this is the way. <laughs> Perfection for me also creates limitations in our human connection, our collective consciousness, right? Because when any one of us create parameters, limiting beliefs around what is perfect, like because we're all, think of it like mushrooms, right? Or all connected in some way and sending information back and forth, whether we're aware of it or not. And so if I bring in this, oh, it's only perfect when, then suddenly I'm sharing that limiting belief with the whole of human consciousness because I've placed that limitation. Now, we all know that our negative brain bias loves to just grab onto things and then the inner critic grabs onto that negative brain bias. So either you, people begin to step up and attempt to reach those unrealistic standards of perfect that I've created, even if it's only in my own circle, and then they start sharing that in their circles and their circles, and it starts to spread like wildfire. And we've got these limiting beliefs around what is perfect. And if my inner critic is telling me, but you're not perfect, you're not going to measure up to that. Your collective now says this is the ideal of perfect, but you're not in alignment with that. So you're broken. You're not worthy of even going for that versus if we did all come at it from this awareness that perfect is an illusion but preference is very real. Mm -hmm. It opens the gateway to, okay, this is my preference. That's your preference. This is their preference and this is their preference. And so, wow, there are multiple ways to experience this reality in this world. And I don't have to fit into a mold anymore. So shoop, you just took away your ego and your inner critics fuel. Just like that. Gone. I love that. That's so powerful. I mean, if if someone said to us, you're not perfect, or if we said it to ourselves, you know, or, or sorry, someone, yeah, you're not perfect, or I'm not perfect. Um, either way. Either way. Two-way street. <laughs> either two-way street. Um, what an opportunity to reframe. You know, instead of it being a negative, like that's a bad thing. Like I'm, I'm, not, I'm not perfect. I shouldn't even, I shouldn't even go, go for this. Well, if you started saying, well, I'm not perfect, so that means I'm not closed off. That means I'm not stagnant. You know, that means that I am actually in alignment with the universe that's growing and expanding. And a willing contributor. And a willing contributor. Beautiful. A beautiful yeah. contribution. Thank Willingly. you. Willingly. <laughs> I will receive that. <laughs> um, talk about reframing. So immediately, like you just said, that's how we... Uh, pull the rug from under the inner critic, mm -hmm. right? Because that's what it's going to be feeding on those, those illusions that you're talking about. And so if we want to fuel the inner champion, then, then we say, yeah, you're right. I am not perfect because I am open and expansive and in collaboration, which puts me in the exact space 
to be the greatest version of the grandest vision of who I am through limitless potential. And grow into the next version. Yes. And the next version. Mm -hmm. Again, I always circle it back around because in my own internal reflections, anytime I'm sitting in meditation or I'm looking at where I've grown, I don't even want to say how far I've come because it's relative, right? It's just that I've grown from what in my youth I desired and saw as amazing. Like getting to go to the movies three times a week is not perfect for me anymore, right? Where as a, in my younger years, you know, we didn't have Netflix and Hulu mm-hmm. and all of the things that we have now. So going to the movies three times a week was just like so perfect because it was a social interaction. It was seeing what the latest creative flow was. So many wonderful things. But because I didn't leave that as my perfect, then I was able to embrace Hulu, Netflix, all of these other Paramount Plus, you name it. Mm -hmm. It's all coming to me now so that when I do go to, when I choose to go to a movie, I still have that sense that I had when I was a kid, but I haven't limited my ability to enjoy movies, especially ones that may not have made their way into the theater because they're an indie film. Mm -hmm. So I get to see these things because I'm not like just clinging to what was perfect for me. Mm -hmm. That means it's a preference, right? And that's so important because we're going to reflect back and we're going to say, look how I've expanded in my awareness while the world around me is also expanding in its awareness. And the people I care about are expanding in their awareness. And we're able to just embrace so much more, so much more. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. So I would ask anybody listening to this, Feel back, like remember what was perfect to you when you were 10, when you were 15, when you were 20, when you were 25. Like, is it still your ideal of perfect? Because if it's not, it's probably a preference. Yeah, Yeah, that's a great point. And maybe seek to understand how to reframe perfectionism. Yes. You know, if we don't need to put that that type of pressure on ourselves, you know, then, then why do it? Why even focus on that? You know, one of the biggest things that humanity tends to do is overcomplicate things. And this is one of those opportunities to shift away from overcomplication just by shifting a, a word. But that word has a whole ideology and a mindset that we don't recognize the impact that it has. And so if we can adjust that into something that is fulfilling, you know, perfectionism, it's, it's a trick because it sounds fulfilled, but it's truly unfulfilled. Yes. And I think that when we start to recognize process instead or preference, then we can recognize that that's where we can actually expand into fulfillment because to some degree, go back to the very first question that you had through this conversation, I've kind of had that realization that um, what is perfectionism? Maybe it's a lack of knowledge. Knowledge is limited by awareness. The only way to grow knowledge is to expand the awareness to then understand, oh, now that I have that awareness, then I can gain more knowledge. Well, if you're already at perfect, then in essence, you're in a lack of knowledge. Now, as soon as you said the why put that pressure on yourself, mm-hmm. why create that pressure? You know, we, I definitely heard, well, pressure creates diamonds. <laughs> and so that pressure is actually perfect in its own right. What would you say to that? <sighs> oh, that's a really good one. There, 
I would say that's great, but I'm not sure that diamonds are relative to the conversation. <laughs> <laughs> I really don't see how that has anything to do with it. Like it's a great saying, but you know, but I want to be the diamond, right? So the pressure is going to make me the diamond. Right. But diamonds are also, this world is replete with diamonds. And so what is the benefit of being something that is around and that everyone can have? Where's the uh, special edition of that? Yeah. You know, and so, you know, and hey, to each his own. If someone wants to be a diamond, that's that's great. You know, but it's... Uh, it's based on industry that restricts its flow in order to create a, a false demand. And so that's, is that, is that a perfect situation? I don't think so. I think that's kind of fraudulent. Yeah. And so, you know, pressure is great. I mean, maybe that's something you can seek to understand, but Pressure also creates cracks and foundations. Oh, yeah, that's a good, that's right. a, it's a great way to put it. So we can say pressure creates diamonds, of course, but pressure can also crack you and break you down. Yes. And that's, I feel, where we need to start looking and saying, what is this undue pressure doing to me? Mm. Is it creating stress unnecessarily? as I move towards someone else's ideal of perfection? No. Is it cracking my foundation? Mm -hmm. Or is it truly, if you want to be a diamond, is it truly adding to you in a way that will help you shine brighter? Because sometimes there is pressure that helps you step forward, but it's the lack of knowing, the lack of mindful awareness, as you were talking about that awareness, that will help you say, hey, this pressure is actually helping me or this pressure is breaking me, Yeah. right? And if I'm doing it based on somebody's ideal of what something is, most of the time it's going to create cracks in our foundation because we're going to be attempting to build ourselves according to their foundation. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. I think it's so good. Um, and there's so many of those kind of sayings, you know, like early bird gets the worm, but then you can follow up with second mouse gets the cheese, uh -huh. you know? And so it's not, there's, there's all these ideologies that we kind of stick ourselves into. Yes. And I think you're spot on with asking the question. I think that's, that's way more important to I me. Mean, that's, that's back to collaboration versus one way. If we're just stuck in one thought, one, one approach, one result, you know, that's going to inherently limit us. When we start to ask questions, then through questions, we can expand our awareness. By expanding our awareness, then we can gain more knowledge. By gaining more knowledge, then we can grow. And if that's really, that to me is in the essence of what the universe is doing in that sense. And we're doing it through multiple perspectives. And so to limit the, not only the human collective perspective by placing a illusion of perfection, which I think is a huge mistake, you know, applying that to the universe just makes the universe so small yes. and so little. And, and that's, there's, what's the fun in that? But you can control small. <laughs> yeah. And if that is what is driving my behavior, I'll turn it inward. If my behavior is to make something smaller so that I can feel bigger, mm. And I can direct or control it instead of experiencing it as it is, then that's again where I have to ask myself, who's driving my bus right now? Is it my ego? Is it my inner critic? Or is it my true soul and my soul's desire to constantly evolve? Yeah, that's really good. Where is the pressure coming from? Is it because someone's stepping on you? Uh-huh. I mean, it's still pressure. Is it self-created? And if yeah. so, how's that helping you? Exactly. And to me, that's one of the greatest tools is that willingness to consciously ask yourself all these questions. One of the tools in the book is the seven whys. And I think that so, for me, has been very, very valuable because I ask myself, why? Why do I feel this way? Why is this happening? 
why is this emotion coming up? I just, I do it seven times to go through all seven chakras because if you are someone who's into Eastern philosophy and chakra centers, each one brings something different, right? Ancient wisdoms show us this. So I have found asking myself, why, why do I need to be perfect? And really focusing on my, my crown, my head and saying, okay, what's in my head that's making me think I need to be perfect? What is my forward vision for my third eye? Why do I feel visionary wise? I have to be perfect. Where's that taking me? Throat. Why do I feel like I need to be perfect with everything I say? Is that limiting my voice? And so just going down through all of the chakras and asking that why question is very empowering. That's beautiful. I love that. And if you are finding yourself really caught in the clutches of perfectionism and asking yourself, how do I navigate from it? Or why am I even doing this? Then we have so many videos out here on the Heart Leader podcast for you to explore to help you begin to break inward into yourself and crack that code. You can also go to silenceyourinnercritic.com and sign up to be on the wait list for the book, Silence Your Inner Critic, and we will send you tools to your inbox that can help you begin to break down that perfectionism versus preference approach to how you're navigating life. Until next time, we look forward to chatting with you right here in the Heart Leader community. 